Tonight, a great privilege. We get to hear from Brian Twombly. And as you know, Brian and his wife, Kara, and their family are here in Arizona for a few months uh, preparing to go to Papua New Guinea. And in many ways, uh, the Twombleys are an answer to many prayers related to Papua New Guinea, not only to meet an immediate need uh, related to logistics in Medang, but long-term to build, help build the base there so that a thriving church could become a platform for training pastors, so that it could also become a place where uh, good translation work is done for much-needed resources into the Melanesian pidgin, the trade language that's spoken there. And so we look forward to seeing all that God will do uh, in the work in Papua Papua New Guinea, uh, but just thankful for Brian and Care to be here. Brian's been a friend for a long time, and uh, he's always been a good host to me when I've been in his world, in his town, and uh, now it's a thrill to have him here in Arizona. It's a thrill for uh, us to share him with you and to hear God's word from him. So, Brian, come on up. Thanks, brother. Good evening, everyone. As Smed just said, my name is Brian Twombly, and uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, there are so many people who don't know my first name. <laughs> we uh, are so commonly referred to as the Twombleys or Twombly uh, that uh, I had the privilege of uh, being at Gilbert Bible. Uh, last night, and so many people came up to me, and they said, oh, is this your first week? It's so nice to meet you. And I introduced myself, and I said, yes, my name's Brian. And they say, how, you know, how'd you find out about us? And I was like, well, I'm actually going to be sharing tonight. Uh, and they said, Twombly? And uh, so there's this, uh, there's this missing, uh, there's a little bit missing of my first name. So it is Brian. Um, and so uh, Smed, when he asked me if I would share tonight, uh, he asked if I would just give a, a little bit of an introduction to myself, my family share a little bit of my testimony and then the, the work that we're looking to do in Medang and then uh, open up God's word with you. And so uh, as we do so, again, my name is Brian Twombly. And so uh, it, it is okay if you refer to me by Twombly, I will look and uh, respond. So I'm not sure my kids will. Uh, we are a family of five. So my wife and, and my three kids are with us. And uh, it's likely you may have met myself or my wife. It is more likely you may have met my kids. And so uh, Sadie and Penelope June, or PJ. They are very uh, social. It's likely they may have come up to you and introduced themselves to you and, and told you all about uh, what they had for breakfast or, or something really important like that. And so, uh, yeah, and then we have Uriah. So Sadie is five. I don't know why I did the middle one, but so Sadie is five. Penelope is three. Uh, and then Uriah is six. And so those are our three kids. We love them uh, greatly. They are an absolute blessing to our family. Uh, they make life fun and uh, they sanctify us. And so just a, just a sweet, sweet gift that the Lord has given us in those three little souls. And so that's our family. And then my wife, Kara, uh, has been patiently married to me for uh, eight years now. And uh, just a, a gift also from the Lord. Uh, so a little bit about myself, uh, born and raised in South Florida, uh, spent really my whole life there. I, I spent a couple months in, in other places like North Carolina, uh, and then uh, went to a two-year missionary training school in South Texas. Uh, but other than that, um, everything really from the day that I was born to the day that I graduated high school was spent in the same household, uh, which actually just recently purchased my parents' house. So we still have that house, but just a, a sweet thing. Um, and the Lord uh, graciously saved me when I was going into 10th grade. So my 10th year, 10th grade year of high school that summer, uh, went away to a Christian summer camp. And uh, that's when the Lord saw fit to open my eyes to the gospel and, and, and make it attractive and save me, draw me to himself. And so uh, what's interesting about that is beforehand, uh, I always thought I was a believer. I thought I was a Christian. I had uh, some understanding of the gospel. I knew that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and, and that all you needed to do was ask for that forgiveness and, and then you would be forgiven. And uh, what my uh, acute understanding of Jesus did was it created uh, a person who lived two very different lives. And so uh, I would, on Friday and Saturday and every other day of the week, I would pursue after my sin. Uh, and then on Saturday night, to Sunday morning, I would, I would tell Jesus I was sorry. 
Uh, and then I would go to church and uh, create some form of emotionalism that made me feel better about myself. And then after I left church on Sunday, I would just begin that process all over again. And so just living for myself, living for the idols of my heart, living for whatever felt good or uh, sounded good in the moment. And so uh, that was uh, really, I mean, my life from the time that I was born up until uh, the Lord saved me when I was going into 10th grade. Uh, an interesting part uh, about my family and the ministry that we're looking to do, and I think it's so impactful, uh, it's so so helpful for people to know uh, when they think about us and our desire to go to Madang in particular, but PNG, is that uh, we wanted to go to the mission field a long time ago, and uh, we actually were doing everything in our ability to go to the mission field a long time ago. Uh, my wife and I met at a missionary training school nine years ago, uh, and, and in that time, uh, we met in August the first year, and then we got married in August the second year. It's important that I say first year, second year, because I say we met in August, got married in August, and people are like, what? So no, we're not one month, a year. So we met and got married a year later. And um, in that, in the, at, towards the end of our second year, uh, as you go to a missionary training school, like the one that we were a part of, there's this expectation that uh, as you get through this process, you are then going to the mission field. And so uh, they would say, hey, you're, you're ready to go to the mission field. You're here. You've done this program. And uh, we uh, were doing that. We were pursuing the mission field. We were talking to people about, hey, would you be on our team? Hey, would you go with us? And really uh, trying to facilitate those conversations. And uh, in that time, in the Lord's providence, uh, my pastor at the time uh, flew from Florida to Texas and uh, shared with me some counsel that I didn't love, but I needed to hear. Uh, and and the, the gist of that counsel was that I was not ready to go to the mission field. Um, we we're in our young 20s. We were in our first year of marriage. We, uh, uh, Kara was pregnant at the time. And so if you can imagine, uh, if you were trying to write a list of who shouldn't go to the mission field, uh, first year of marriage, uh, no ministry experience other than like volunteer stuff, uh, first baby in the belly. Uh, there's so much that goes on in that season of life. And so uh, just in the Lord's providence sent my pastor and, and his wisdom saw fit to just confront us in the life that we were pursuing. Hey, you, we love you and we care about you and we want you to be missionaries, but you are not ready. And so uh, I, I say that now and I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for that counsel. But in the moment, I was so angry. Uh, I, uh, I, tr I struggled with that counsel because everything that I wanted to do was this, and, and yet the counsel that I was being given was this, and I knew he was right. And so uh, I praise the Lord in his kindness. He uh, humbled me and allowed us to even submit to that counsel. And so for the last seven years, uh, my wife and I have been living and serving and growing in our local church in, in Stewart, Florida. And so in that time, uh, the things that we were doing were, it were all preparation for the mission field. And the way that that worked was we actually did nothing to prepare for the mission field. What we did was we served in the local church. That was our training. We were, were being groomed and fed and encouraged and discipled by our elders uh, and given the opportunity to serve and, and do church ministry, uh, and then simultaneously uh, was given the opportunity to lead the student ministry at our church, and then uh, take seminary classes with the Expositor Seminary, and so uh, doing all three of those things, you can imagine we had plenty, plenty of free time. Uh, we did not, and so uh, that was what the Lord uh, had allowed us to do, do and take part of, and I am so grateful. Uh, I am so grateful, and I'd love to share more about that, but uh, it's so important that uh, we really, that I, I draw that out for you because it's such a significant part of our testimony, even when we think about going to the mission field, because, uh, and, and you know this as a church, but for, for people to go and do missions, for people to go and plant churches, it is, it is necessary that the right people go. It is necessary that people who are trained go to the mission field. It is necessary that people who are mature go to the mission field. Uh, because the work there is, is tough. Uh, there's, a, there's a pastor, um, I, I believe it was Joel James, who says that uh, missionary uh, missions is your ecclesiology with a passport. 
Uh, and if that being true, and, and if church planning is what missions is, making disciples and in, in planning churches, if that's what the goal is in missions, then the people who need to be doing that are, are elders and, and pastors. And so uh, just, again, so grateful that the Lord uh, used uh, one man to come and, and, and bring really hard truth to us. And, uh, and so to kind of go full circle, about two months ago, uh, that, that same church where that elder came and, and shared that truth with us ordained myself. And so uh, just a, a tremendous blessing to be a, uh, able to go through that. And uh, uh, Scott Maxwell was a part of the ordination council and just really instrumental in those, in those days as well. And so just so grateful. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, the Twombly family. Uh, and so now looking at Medang, and this is, I'm so thankful, uh, Jeremy Lehman just recently shared about the ministry of Finisterre Vision, Finisterre Mission, and gave that update. And if you haven't watched it, please watch it. Please watch, and you will get a, um, a significant amount of information that will help you to know how to pray better for your missionaries and, and to have a better understanding of what is happening in PNG. Uh, so we like to say that we are the first installments of Team Medang. Uh, and so my family and I uh, are, are, are hoping to be one of many. So maybe another family, maybe another two families would come and join with us and, and do uh, the work that we are attempting and desiring to do as a, as a team. And so when we think about that, Team Medang is looking to do four, four main things. Uh, the first one would be to help see uh, a faithful biblical church established in the town of Medang. And so uh, what does that look like? That is a great question. And when we figure it out, we will let you know. So no, we, we're not sure if that will be church planting or church strengthening. Uh, but what we do know is that there needs to be a faithful church there. And so uh, that's, that would be number one. Number two would be translation. Uh, and this would be of ministry resources and then potentially looking at the scriptures. Uh, and then third would be uh, the, the logistical support uh, that you guys know so well and have been praying for. Uh, and that would be the, to serve the Mitchells and the Cans and then any future teams that will go. And then fourthly, uh, it will be pastoral training. Uh, there's this desire to, to see men uh, trained in Medang. Uh, and in a, uh, a really a twofold uh, mindset, the way that I see it would be the, the pastors in the churches in the town of Medang, but then also the pastors that are, that are being uh, raised up right now in towns like Maui Roro, that the pastors there would have a place to come down to and receive further training. And so uh, that's what uh, Team Medang is looking like and looking at doing. And so uh, it's a lot. And so one of our biggest prayer requests is that another family would come with us and that there would be uh, someone who would say, man, I am, I am mature. I am qualified. I am capable to serve and in particular to do the, the logistical type things. But uh, someone who would come and, and, and by no means will the, someone come and do just logistics. So as you are uh, trying to establish a church, there will be a, a plenty of things for you to do. And so uh, if that uh, is something that you may be able or something you could fill, please talk to your elders, talk to them and they would uh, be able to kind of shepherd you guys through that. So please do that. Uh, lastly, uh, before we jump into God's word tonight, uh, a little bit of a timeline. And so uh, we are here, my wife and our, my wife, my three kids and myself are here uh, through about the first week of November. Uh, and so after that first week, we're going to be making our way back across the country uh, and stopping in hopefully Houston and Colorado and Oklahoma uh, to do some, some visiting a family and then also meeting with some churches and then uh, eventually make it back to Florida in a three or four week time span. Uh, and then we hope to be there from December uh, with a desire to leave in March. And so we would love to be in PNG in the month of March. And so uh, that's, that's where we are as far as the timeline is concerned. And so... Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to make a shift. And so, uh, tonight we're going to be in a passage of scripture that, uh, is something that I was able to preach while I was back home, uh, in Stewart and, uh, is not going to be a missions passage, but it, it was, uh, uh, pastor Smedley asked me, he said, Hey, can you preach? And I said, yes. And I sent him a couple options and this is the one that he chose. And so I have to say that because, uh, tonight we're going to be looking at taming the tongue or, uh, a warning for those with words. And so I just wanted to preface with, I am not preaching this because of all the observations that I've made about you as a church. Uh, but I am preaching this because, uh, one, it is in God's word and it is so 
so necessary for the life of the believer. And and I think James will make that very clear. Uh, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, and we're going to be in James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And what I'll do is I'll read, pray, and then we will jump into it. Uh, And just as you're thinking through it, we are going to walk through uh, these 12 verses, verse by verse, and and hopefully see uh, what the Lord would have for us tonight. And so, uh, again, we're in James chapter 3, and I'm going to read through verses 1 through 12. And then we will pray and we will jump in. James 3, starting in verse 1, says this. Do not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the entire body as well. Now, if we put the bits in... If we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot wills. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our existence and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this, these things ought not to be so. Does a fountain pour forth from the same opening fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives? Or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are uh, thankful for your word. God, thank you for the way that you have revealed yourself through it. The way that you teach us uh, about you and you teach us about us. God, I pray uh, for this time that it would be fruitful I pray that we as a, as a church would, would have our minds uh, encouraged and convicted, that we would be uh, strengthened, that uh, because of the preaching of your word, that, that we as your saints would be uh, more conformed into your image. I pray that we would be fed. And, and God, I pray for uh, the hearts in this room who, uh, who may be uh, already uh, struggling to, to hear your word. God, I pray that you would humble them uh, and that you, would, uh, that you would do a work that only you can do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. On any given day, a typical person may speak anywhere from 7,000 to 20,000 words in any day. Anywhere from 7,000 to 20,000 words. And it's interesting, uh, a lot of times when you look at these statistics, it's different for men and women, and I'm not going to say which one is more, uh, because frankly, I think I might be a curve breaker. Uh, and then this is, it's also interesting because you know, there's, there's this outlier of this like old cowboy who rides on a horse all day and talks to himself like every three hours and says like two words. So, uh, but on average, uh, the typical person may speak anywhere from 7,000 to 20,000 words. That is such a big number. Uh, And yet, in 16 words, God, through Solomon, said this in Proverbs 10, verse 19. Where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. So we speak 7,000 to 20,000 words a day. Words carry much significance. Our, our tongue uh, can bring healing, encouragement. It can build others up. Proverbs twelve eighteen says that there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. 
and our tongues have the power of life and death. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Think about how many sins we commit with our mouth. How many sins we commit with words that we speak. Anger, arrogance, pride, blasphemy, boasting, complaining, deceit, false witness, foolish talking, coarse joking, malice, murmuring, quarreling, slander, gossip, dishonoring to parents, dishonoring to anyone, fear, heresy, false teaching, mockery, swearing, and the list goes on. There is such a variety of ways in which we can sin against our Lord with our mouth. There is nothing this week that you will do more voluntarily than speak words. There's no action that you do more on a day-to-day basis than speak words. I'm not counting blinking or breathing. Uh, Every human interaction uh, is one in which you will speak to them. It's one in which you will communicate with them. And to add on top of that, the words that you speak to yourself in your head, thousands of opportunities to speak and think in a manner that is worthy or not. And so with the sheer number of words that we speak and the list of ways in which we rebel from God, we are going to spend our time uh, looking at how we ought to master our words, how we ought to master our words. I've titled this a warning for those with words. And the reality is that's all of us. We all have words. We all speak. And so our our timeless truth for tonight is that we must watch our words. That's it. We must watch our words. And so with that, uh, we're going to look at three reasons we must watch our words. Three reasons we must watch our words. And the first one is that our tongue is a serious thing. And as we jump in, I just want to give you a quick flyover of the book of James. I know how fun it is cannonballing into chapter three. You're like, wait a minute. So uh, the book of James, so James is the half-brother of Jesus, uh, and he's writing to believers of the dispersion. uh, And so starting from chapter one, working through, he's, he's talked about trials. He's talked about gaining wisdom from above. He's talked about being a doer of the word and not merely a hearer. Uh, he, he talks about partiality and favoritism. Uh, he's talked about that the true faith which produces obedience. Uh, he's talked about how faith without works is dead. And throughout the book, you see that James is teaching the believers on multiple areas of their life. And it seems as if he's seeking to, in a sense, disciple them or train them up. Uh, he's writing to these believers and he's seeking to bring them up in maturity in the faith. Uh, there are many, many parallels to the book of James, to the book of Proverbs. And so they call it the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, and, and there's just this, there's just this, there's this, this understanding that James cares about those who he's writing to, and he wants them to be mature. He wants them to live lives of obedience. And so again, we're going to see the, the reality that we must watch our words. We must watch our words. Uh, And so for our first reason why we must watch our words is that the tongue is a serious thing. The tongue is a serious thing. I'm going to read verses one and two again. Do not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that you will receive a stricter judgment for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the entire body as well. As we, as we flow through uh, this first section, and we're going to see that our words are a serious thing. And he starts out with this warning to teachers. In, in, this, in this section, he gives this, uh, this, this statement or the reality or this truth that there is a heightened judgment for teachers. He starts, do not, many of you become teachers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Uh, Here he is giving out a warning uh, to all who may want to step into the role of teacher. Uh, Do not. (laughs) And and he's not saying, hey, don't be a teacher. He's saying not many of you should be teachers. He's he's giving this warning of a teacher is not the role that we should all aspire to. 
Uh, and, and then he then gives the reason, but James is, he's instructing that the number, the, the amount should not be this number where it's like, hey, everyone wants to be a teacher. Uh, and, and as we think through that, we'll see that, one, God thinks very highly of his word and the teaching of it. God thinks so highly of his word and the teaching of it. To reference 1 Peter 4, verse 11, it says, whoever speaks, teaching, speaking of the gifts that God has given, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. So Peter sees that, that, that when you are speaking, you are speaking the utterances of God. There is a significant weight for those who preach and teach the word, for they are speaking the utterances of God. So there's this heightened judgment for teachers. James says this, not many of you should become teachers, and here's why. Knowing, you should know that we will receive stricter judgment. Just two observations from that. He says, we will. Uh, We will, meaning he is including himself into this statement. We, I, myself as a teacher, am going to incur this stricter judgment. And he says, we will. Uh, There's this future tense. He's saying, this is going to happen. If you're a teacher, you will incur stricter judgment. Uh, This should make us stop and think. If you are a teacher of God's word, you will receive a stricter judgment. Uh, What does this mean, a stricter judgment? Uh, Ultimately, to teach, to be influential, to be a spokesperson of God and God's word puts you in a place for stricter judgment. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 36 says this, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. So what he's saying here is that if you teach or you speak authoritatively about a given topic from God's word, what is happening is that you are going to be given a stricter judgment. There there is a a heavier speculation that is given upon you for the things in which you have done. In Matthew 12, that verse, what he references is for every word that we speak, not teachers, but generally, every word that you speak, you will be given, you will be judged for. And so then James adds to that, and if you are a teacher, it will be even more severe. Think about if you if you are wanting to teach something or speak authoritatively about the word of God, what you are doing. And think about this: what would happen if you took a group of people and you taught them a biblical truth that was wrong? And then that people went and did something in rebellion against the Lord. And that's so weighty. And so that stricter judgment, James is giving this warning to to give you a, a second to say, hang on. Maybe I should really think through the weight of that before I jump into an opportunity like that. Um, there's a, there's a passage in Mark and, and, and this, this passage isn't exclusively speaking about those who are, are solely teachers, but listen to what Mark nine says, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him. If with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. That is how severe God thinks about people being led astray. That it would, be, it would be better for them to have a big rock tied to their neck and them thrown into the ocean. There is this stricter judgment for those who will want to teach. And so he starts off and saying, not many, not many of you should be teachers. Uh, and then as we progress through, uh, we see that there is not only a, this warning to not be teachers, but then it, it, James opens it up to there is this warning for all of our language. And so through the next 11 verses, we're going to see uh, that, that not only is there a warning for teachers in the, their words, but that uh, all people, all people need to be watching their words. And so we see that there's this widespread inclination to trip. He says this, for we all stumble in many ways, for we all stumble in many ways. And, and the way that this is, the way that this is, uh, sh- the way that this is defined or the way that this is in the Greek is it says, for we all stumble in much, or we all stumble in many. And so what James is referencing here is not uh, the, the amount of sin as he's saying about the variety of sin for we all stumble in many ways, Uh, not the quantity, but the variety. And so uh, although because of the variety, it does end up turning into the quantity, but there's this, there's this, 
um, the point that's being made is that we all, we all stumble in so much. And there's this widespread stumbling. I'm going to read verses two and three again. Sorry, verses one and two again. Do not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the entire body as well. So as he's referencing, there's, there's this widespread inclination to trip. Uh, he then brings it into narrowing to your words. So we all, shrunk, we all stumble in this variety of ways. And to the, the word stumble here, it, it, it literally it just means sin. The word stumble means sin. So James 2, verse, James 2 verse 10 says this, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Uh, so uh, just to, I mean, solidify, because when you think about the word stumble, you're like, oh, whoops, I, I fell into that. No, what James is saying here is we, we all stumble in much. We all sin in much. Uh, to reference what was spoken on this morning and Sunday in the equipping hour, we all have this, uh, this residual depravity, this leftover sin, this, this old man reality that we have. And James here is saying, we are, we are prone to wander. We are prone to wander. And so he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the entire body. So we all, we all stumble in much, but if you can control your mouth, if you, can, if you can tame your tongue, if you can master your words, then you are a perfect man and able to bridle your entire body. So what James is teaching here is the reality that of all the areas that we have in this life to fight, of all the battles that we will have to fight against of indwelling sin, the fight against and to subdue the tongue is the chief. Uh, for the tongue if you can tame the tongue, if you can fight and secure and subdue your tongue, then you can easily subdue any other part of your body. If your tongue is mature and restrained, your other, party, your other body parts will be as well. Uh, Douglas Moo says this in, in his commentary, uh, so difficult is the mouth to control, so given is it to utter the false, the biting, the slanderous word, so prone to stay open when it were more profitably closed that the person who has it in control surely has the ability to keep it in check. Other less unruly member, sorry, has the ability to keep in check the other less unruly members of the body. And so as we, as we draw this first point to a close, we see that our words are very serious. James, God our words are very serious. Proverbs 13, three says this, the one who guards his mouth preserves his life. And the one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Uh, secondly, uh, the second point, the second uh, reason why we ought to watch our words is that our tongue is a powerful thing. Our tongue is a powerful thing. So we saw that our tongue is a serious thing. And now we're going to see that our tongue is a powerful thing. Uh, in this section, James is going to use some illustrations to draw out the huge amount of power that our tongue has, despite its size. Despite the size of our tongue, he's going to draw out how much power it has. So look at verses 3 through 5 with me. Verse 3 says this, Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. They are so great and are driven by strong winds. They are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot wills. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. And yet it boasts of great things. Uh, when I was uh, just out of high school, I was given the opportunity to share and, and counsel and work at a, a summer camp for, for high school and middle school teenagers. Uh, and one of the summers that I worked at, I was given the opportunity to spend time with a kid who had just gone through a very, very traumatic uh, season of life. Uh, and what had happened in the season of life for this kid is that um, his older brother at the time was dating a girl. And uh, his girlfriend at the time was not doing well, and the, the brother wanted to break up with his girlfriend, and the girlfriend said, no, you can't. 
I'm pregnant. And these are high school students. And uh, this, this, this brother uh, ended up going and committing suicide. And uh, roll the camera a little bit further. Come to find out what the, the girl had said was actually a lie. She wasn't pregnant. She was just trying to use her words to keep what she wanted. And it led this, to this chain reaction of this kid going and, and killing himself. And, and I remember getting to sit with this kid and explaining to him uh, the truth of God's word. Uh, and, but then I remember the days and weeks after and just getting to sit and really meditate on the, the reality and the weight of what had happened. And, and when I, I read a verse like this and I think through a passage like this and, I, and we think about how powerful our tongue is, this, this one lie and what that led to, uh, just, again, should, should cause us to stop, should cause us to think. Uh, and so James, uh, to make this point, he, he goes to some, some physical examples, some physical illustrations that he has uh, to talk about how uh, such tiny things have such great power. Uh, and so he talks first with a horse. And verse 3 says, now if we put the bits in the horse's mouth so they will obey us and we direct... And we direct their entire body as well. And so you guys understand what a horse's bit is. It's just that little metal bar that goes into the, horse, the horse's mouth. And what happens over time is the horse rider draws his, on the reins, that metal bit will, will ultimately cut into uh, the, the nerve endings in the lips and the mouth of that horse. And so uh, early on, as you're trying to break a horse in, uh, and you have this understanding of like a, a horse is a pretty stubborn animal at first, but when you finally break a horse and you put a bridle into its mouth, it doesn't take but a, a tiny, tiny amount of pull on the reins for you to get that entire horse to go, okay, we'll go this way, and okay, we'll go this way. And so there's this picture of this tiny piece of metal can control, and James, he makes it sound like this huge horse, this huge, powerful horse. And then in verse, verse 4, he does the same thing, talking about a ship. He goes, look at these huge boats. And this, thinking, you know, 2,000 years ago, we're not talking the Titanic, but we're talking significant boats, huge ships. And he says, these huge ships, although they're driven by the wind and the rain and the, and the waves, he says, when, when the captain of that ship says, we're going right, he turns this little tiny rudder of the boat. And what happens is the boat goes right. And so there's this picture of you have these huge, powerful things, and yet they're driven by this small, seemingly insignificant part. Uh, and, and then he does so to use those two to then connect that to, and he says, and so too, the small tongue has this great power. Listen to this, verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. There's this picture here of you've got the, the backlash and the power that the tongue has, and yet it's just this tiny little thing that sits inside of your mouth. It's just interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that I get to teach this as week two of what Scott has been going through in the equipping hour. Think about uh, the, the realities that have been going through your mind when you're thinking about uh, building and rebuilding unity. Uh, the question, how many of us have been affected by the power of someone else's words? Yeah, if you've been living for all of like 13 seconds, you know what I mean. That, that people's words have the ability to affect us. Whether it's deceit, gossip, backbiting, you name it, uh, this can be uh, on a micro scale for, uh, you know, someone said something a little quicker than they should have and, and reconciliation can happen in 13 seconds. Or it can be something that uh, has years and years of built up bitterness and anger and sins like these. That is how powerful our words are. Uh, one quote that I, I find to be so profound, it says this, far easier to heal are the wounds caused by sticks and stones than of the damage caused by words. You know, it's interesting. You know that phrase that you were all told when you were a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. It's not true. It's not. Words are a powerful thing. Physically, maybe, right? No one's ever going to throw a word and it's going to hit you in the head. But the weight and the power that a, that a word has is so big. 
so large. So as we transition, uh, I want to read James chapter 1, verse 26. It says this, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. An untamed mouth is the mark of self-deception. And the tongue is a powerful thing. The tongue is a powerful thing. So first we've seen that the tongue is serious. Secondly, we saw that the tongue is powerful. And lastly, we're going to see that the tongue is dangerous. The tongue is a dangerous thing. Uh, when I was given the opportunity to teach this to the students um, at, in our church, we, uh, I used this example of a loaded gun. Uh, when we think about our words, that our words are like that of a loaded gun. I'm personally not carrying a gun right now, but imagine if I was. And imagine if I just took my pistol out and I was like, hey, Smed, catch. And I just threw it to him. First of all, half of you guys would get up and start running at me, but the other half of you would be like, what is this guy doing? You don't just throw a gun. You don't, you don't just mess around with a gun. Why is that? Because we know that a gun has the ability to, in a second, to slip and hit something, boom. And what happens is life and death can be changed by that. We have this understanding of like when we think about a loaded gun, we, we, are, we are cautious we are, uh, we are patient. We are not flippant with it. And so uh, when, we th- when we say things like the tongue is a dangerous thing, I want you to have this picture in your mind that my tongue can be like that of a loaded gun. My tongue can be like that of a loaded gun. Man, if we, if we would reference and think about our tongue and our words in that manner, we would, we would save so much heartache. Verses, the second half of uh, verse 5 through 12 says this. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our existence. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a fountain pour, for, does a fountain pour forth from the same opening fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? nor can salt water produce fresh water. So going back up to the top, he says, behold how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. So now James is transitioning and, and no longer is he using these similes, right? He's not using, okay, uh, a horse's bit, the, the ship's rudder, but he says, no, the tongue is a fire. He doesn't say, oh, your tongue is like a fire. No, your tongue is a fire. It is that dangerous. Uh, and then he uses this picture of a forest fire. Uh, and it's so interesting when you think about, so in Florida, we don't really have forest fires. We don't really have forests. And so we have a beach and we have uh, palm trees. So that's like it. And, uh, uh, but hearing about all these fires, uh, my wife and I were in Wyoming a couple weeks ago. And the, the mountain range that we uh, were able to see from where we were staying was actually really foggy in one day. And I was asking, like, why is it like that? And he's like, oh, that's from the fires in Idaho. And just thinking about this truth of a, a forest fire, how big a forest fire can be. And yet, what is it started by? A little spark. Uh, and, and there's this picture that's being painted of your tongue is a fire. Uh, and in particular, it is capable of doing damage like that of a forest fire. John Calvin says, a slender portion of flesh contains the whole world of iniquity. That, that is how dangerous your tongue is. And it says, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. It's this small entity, but it is so dangerous. It packs enough sting to ruin you. It says, defiling the entire body. Uh, and just thinking through this term, defilement. Uh, It has this picture of uh, this Old Testament picture of uh, something that's unclean or is defiled. It's no longer useful for worship. Um, One commentator says this, uh, the tongue, speaking of the tongue, it continually corrupts 
or defiles the person who speaks wrongly, uh, just as fire burns out of control. That your tongue is that dangerous. It sets on fire the course of our existence and is set on fire by hell. The whole life from the time that you can talk, your whole life from the time that you can talk to the time that you will lay your body into the ground and go into eternity has the ability to be set on fire by hell because of your tongue. The tongue is uh, destructive. And when you think about the tongue, uh, the ability and the danger that it carries, again, he, he points back to this picture of it is destructive and it wreaks havoc. It corrupts your entire life. And this is the danger that is contained in our tongue, like that of a forest fire. An unrestrained tongue is uh, not just a killer of those who are around you, but it is also to its owner. It, it is destructive. The very fingerprint and marching orders of the enemy, the father of lies. And so the end of the road of the owner of the untamed tongue is eternal destruction. So working through to verse seven, uh, for every kind of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. So uh, James here is painting this picture of we can tame animals. Take a lion. We can tame it. Take a bear. We can tame it. Take a fish. We can teach. We can teach an orca whale to do a backflip at SeaWorld. But you can't tame your tongue. Proverbs 21, 23 says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Um, continuing, uh, just, it is a restless evil. It is uncontrolled. Your tongue, it stands at the ready. And then as we get through verses nine through 12, he just talks about from the same, from the same source, can, can salt water and bitter water come or fresh water and bitter water? Uh, can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives? And tucked right in the middle of this section, verses 9 through 12, you see uh, James, he, he gives this, this almost like this cry. He says, these things, in verse 10, these things ought not to be so. When he, when he talks about from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, James simply is saying that there is no place for wickedness in the mouth of a believer that our, the sins of our mouth are very dangerous. And just think about, think about when we are prone to speak sinfully. When we sin with our tongues, we are ultimately sinning against our creator who created us and gave us our tongue. God is the creator of all things and he is in control of all things and he is good and he does good. And sinful anger and frustration and complaining and gossip and dishonor and slander are all forms of rebellion towards God's creation or God's sovereign work in your life. So when we sin with our lips, it's not merely just a, a, a cry out or a, a rebellion against what we're going through, but it is, a, it, is a, it is a rebellion and attack against God. And it has no place in the life of the believer. So James would say, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. There's no place for wickedness in the mouth of a believer and your tongue is dangerous. So what have we seen? We've seen that our tongue is a serious thing. We've seen that our tongue is a powerful thing. And we've seen that our tongue is a dangerous thing. So what do we do with all of this? Uh, we should, first of all, think much about our words. We should think much about our words. Matthew 12, verse 36 says this. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Do we ever do that? Church, do you ever speak careless words? How are we using our words for good or for bad? Uh, continuing, because of our words, because the weight that our words carry, we ought to view them rightly. We should speak with thoughtfulness. We should speak with intentionality. I think one, one good example is think about if you were about to sit in a massive job interview. How do you answer the questions of the person who is interviewing you? You're thoughtful, you're intentional. Don't say, um, right? You, you spend so much time making sure you don't say certain things and you craft every sentence that you say. Why? Because you care about the words that you're speaking. And that we ought to bring that same weight whenever our mouths are open. 
We have to weigh our words before we are speaking. Uh, James has already hit on this in, in chapter 1, verse 19, where he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed forth from your mouth, but only such as a word as is good for the edification according to the need for the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear it. And so, uh, practical helps in how to watch our words. Uh, Ultimately, one of the best ways that you can watch your words is to protect what is going inside of you. Protect what is going in your eyes, your mind, your heart, whether it be entertainment or bad influences, the things you hear, the things you read, the things you see, the songs you hear. All of this is going inside of your mind. Uh, Next, you can make sure that your mind is constantly being renewed in the word and not the world. We don't naturally drift into faithfulness. Uh, We have to work. We have to pursue after the Lord. We have to be recalibrating our minds in the word of God. Uh, Another way that we can help watch our words is to know yourself. Know yourself. Know uh, whether you are anxious or weary or angry or emotional or weakened in any way. Sometimes the most God honoring thing that you can do is be quiet. Some biblical lessons that should define our speech. I'm just going to reference, and I can give you the references for where these are, but Proverbs 15 calls us to be gentle with our words. Proverbs 12 calls us to be wise with our words. Proverbs 16 calls us to be pleasant. Ephesians 6, not provoking. Ephesians 4 says, not unwholesome, but good for edification. Uh, Grace giving, not slanderous, not malicious. Hebrews 3 calls us to use our words to encourage. And there are so many more where these come from. In all of this, when you get to the end and you think, okay, my mouth is serious, it's powerful, it's dangerous, you may be tempted to think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm never going to speak again. That's the best thing I could possibly do. If it's that weighty, right? If it is that weighty and it, it is powerful, it's serious, it's dangerous, I mean, look at Job, right? Job answered in, first, in chapter 40, Job answered Yahweh and said, Behold, I'm insignificant. What can I do? Or what can I respond to you? I placed my hand over my mouth. We should do that, right? We, we, should, we should be quiet. And the truth is, uh, one of the main steps that we need to do and take uh, as we seek to master our mouth and, and tame our tongue is that it first starts Uh, not just at our tongue, but in our heart. Taming the tongue is going to start in your heart. Watching our words is heart work. Our speech ultimately is what reflects what is inside of our heart. Our heart's content is put on display when we speak. Matthew 12 says this, you brood of vipers, now how can you being evil speak what is good for the mouth speaks out of which fills the heart. Uh, Luke six forty five. the good man uh, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Uh, in our household, we say that your mouth tattletales on you. It tattletales what's on what is happening in your heart. Think about the list of sins that I referenced at the beginning. Anger, complaining, malice, deceit, dishonor. All of this starts spiritually in your chest cavity. Your words reflect your character. So when we think about mastering our words and watching our words, uh, we ought to. We ought to spend time and recognize that we need to speak slowly. We need to speak with intentionality. Uh, And if ultimately, if you have submitted all of who you are to the Lord, then your tongue is a part of that. If you have submitted yourself to the Lord, your tongue is a part of that. Your life, your body, your speech is all submitted to God. If your will is the will of God, your tongue ought to be marked with maturity and your words must be well watched. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word and thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word. God, thank you for the grace that you show us Uh, although we can sometimes be so prone to wander. uh, I got to pray for this church that they would be encouraged, that they would be fed, uh, and that they would uh, be differently because of, of your word tonight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.